Crew members are airlifted to safety from the foundering $40 million superyacht Yogi. Shortly after, the vessel plunged to the bottom of the Aegean Sea. But why did this technologically advanced superyacht sink? In part one, we looked at the events based on the captain's recollections to the CEO of the shipbuilder, Protexan Turquoise, shortly after his rescue. In part two, we will look at the official report, the response from the shipyard, and the questions that remain. Yogi was one of three sister ships built at Protexan Turquoise. However, she differed from the other two in that she had been extended by six meters, and the sun deck had been covered with a hard top. The changes made to the superstructures in comparison to her sister ships had led to a raise in the center of gravity. Because of the extra weight on the sun deck, she required an extra 27 metric tons of ballast to be welded to the keel during the build process to resolve the raised center of gravity. The yacht's design initially had the beach club in the aft section of the vessel as one compartment, i.e. no watertightness between the two compartments. However, upon inspection, this arrangement was not compliant and the design needed to be changed and a watertight door added to create Beach Club 1 and Beach Club 2. Upon second inspection, the damage stability analysis said that when these two compartments were flooded, this door would have to remain closed whilst the vessel was underway. As explained in part one, the engine exhausts were wet exhausts, meaning the main exhaust outlet of each engine was underwater. However, there was no exhaust temperature alarm downstream of the seawater injection device. This oversight would emerge during the journey from Istanbul to Cannes. There was no voyage data recorder or VDR fitted to this vessel. A voyage data recorder is a seagoing vessel's black box. It records data from the radar, helm data including all inputs, wind speeds, speed over ground, etc. Unlike an aircraft, it can record hours of data, as much as 12 hours or more. It also has a capsule with a hydrostatic release unit and a buoyant device that floats to the surface in the event of a sinking. Unfortunately, this vessel did not require one to be fitted. In June 2011, just two months after delivery, Yogi had a technical recall in Genoa, Italy. This was in order to sort out a problem on the air conditioning system and to repair the damage caused by a leak of refrigerant on the trim and on the carpet. During the work period, some technical and aesthetic deficiencies on the stern door had been carried out and removal and replacement of a door seal which had been deemed poorly bonded but tight with a silicon seal with a more appropriate colour. In addition, on demand of the captain, a 200 litre two compartment tank with submersible pumps was installed aft of the steering gear in compartment 3 to collect dripping water from the beach clubs. The installation required the modification of the draining circuit, however these important modifications, although they affected an installation located under the freeboard deck were not reflected in the ship's as-built drawings and the French authorities were never informed of the changes. Freeboard, in the simplest terms, is the distance from the waterline to the top of a vessel's hull. Changes to a vessel made below the freeboard deck effectively means below the waterline. Work carried out during this technical recall, although carried out in Italy, had been carried out by a team from Protexan Turquoise Shipyard helped by local Italian subcontractors and covered by the warranty. In October 2011, Yogi went back to the factory for further warranty work. And from October 2011 until February 2012, Yogi was in Tuzla for the following work. Recoat or paint the vessel, most likely due to unsatisfactory initial finish. Also, the transom or stern door was removed in order to refit the swim ladder chests and it was necessary to punch the two hinges. The electric connections, the hydraulic spools and the fastenings had to be replaced. Operations had been monitored by an expert, a naval architect and tightness tests had been carried out upon completion, although the lower part of the stern door had not been tested. Crew. There were eight crew on board. A master, a chief officer, a second officer, two chief engineers, a master mechanic, a rating holder for bridge watch and one stewardess. The captain was 51 years old. He joined Yogi in July 2011. Chief engineer one was the joining chief. He was 50 years old. He joined Yogi on the 30th of January 2012. 
he was relieving the existing chief engineer. Chief Engineer 2, the outgoing Chief Engineer, was 35 years old. He had been on the build of Yogi from October 2010, and this was his final trip, and he would be paid off upon arrival in France. The following sequence of events differs from the first video, in that it was drawn up by the flag state from interviews with the crew members and of the DPA, the designated person ashore, as the crew failed to save any records or the alarm report or written log from the vessel. The French flag state, full title on screen, is throughout the rest of this video known as Beamer. At 18.30 hours, out of the Dardanelle Straits, they dropped off the pilot. The vessel was operating normally. The CEO of Protestant Turquoise said afterwards that the AIS was not functioning at this point. Automatic identity systems broadcast a vessel's position on VHF and via satellite, and is a requirement for this vessel. Why was it not working? Beamer offered no explanation. After having a southwesterly route, the vessel was heading at 185 degrees. Speed was said to be 14 knots. On the 17th of February, at approximately 0140 hours, the chief engineer on watch observed that the starboard engine exhaust expansion ring was split and leaking due to overheating. Note, at no point had there been a high temperature alarm. He tried to call the captain who was on watch at the time on the bridge. The phone in the engine control room was out of order. He then tried the emergency interphone system, but this was defective as well. They had just left a four month refit at the shipyard. How could both of these devices be out of order? Why did he not use a handheld UHF or VHF radio? The report indeed stated that the chief engineer did not have with him a handheld radio, even though there were 14 of them on board. This is standard operating procedure for all deck and engine crew on board a vessel whilst on watch. So at a critical time when the engineer had to tell the captain to shut down an engine, he had no direct means of communication with the bridge. Why did the chief engineer not go into the engine room and stop the engine himself? In an emergency, he could have done this locally. This is a photo of the actual engine room on Motiot Yogi. You can see here local controls for starting and stopping the engines. Instead, the chief engineer opted to leave the engine room and go up to the bridge to tell the captain to stop the starboard engine. Soon after, the other engine on the port side experienced similar issues. The exhaust and coolant temperature were also abnormally high. In the captain's recollections to the yacht builders after the incident, he had said the port engine was overheating and he'd shut it down himself. However, in the Beamer report, he had said the chief engineer asked the captain to slow down, but at the same instant the engine automatically shut itself down. Yogi was now dead in the water. Now, according to the Beamer report, she was rolling and listing to port. The report never said what the captain was doing on the bridge to try to control the vessel whilst the engines were offline. All three engineers on board investigated the engine issues. They found the water cooling for the exhaust was insufficient, therefore overheating was occurring. Approximately 0 to 30 hours, the port engine was restarted and the temperatures were back to normal. Relief chief engineer went to the bridge to inform the captain. When the captain engaged the engine, clutched in, he observed there was no answer from the helm. The autopilot was off, and the two steering motors would not start. The steering motors controlled the rudders. The rudders were stuck at a 30 degree angle to starboard. Investigation of the emergency steering room by the engineer found it was partially flooded with 30 to 40 centimeters of water. The captain's recollection to the shipbuilder was that one of the interior watertight beach club doors blew open and lots of water entered, but there was no mention of this in the Beamer report. So how did that area become flooded in the first place? Remember the stern and transom door had been removed under warranty work prior to the trip. The report stated there had been no alarms to indicate flooding in these areas. Why? Why were the auxiliary pumps not able to pump out this water? Were they activated? The vessel had power right up to the crew being airlifted from the vessel. At 0420 hours, a mayday call was made by the captain. As they could not steer the vessel and they could not stop the flooding, they were ready to abandon. The crew found refuge in the superstructures of the vessel. At 0745 hours, a rescue helicopter was dispatched by Greek Secretary Rescue.
By 0830 hours, all crew had been rescued. At 1104 hours, the EPIRB beacon ceased to transmit. This was the final position transmitted. Yogi sank in 500 meters of the Aegean Sea. The shipyard that built Yogi, Protexan Turquoise, took the brunt of the blame shortly afterwards, before any report or investigation had been carried out. Rumour and industry witch hunting caused the shipyard to suffer financially. The shipyard was co-founded by the president, Mamet Karabiyogo, and CEO Hayati Kam. Our yard worked to complete the Yogi project for three years, Karabiyogo said in an interview shortly afterwards. Imagine the man hours that have gone into such a thing, and then to see it all just disappear? Like that? It's a truly sad story. Cam said, I mean, I couldn't believe it. The boat had just left the shipyard in perfect condition a few days before. I was stunned. After the crew was returned to France, the owners of the shipyard requested a formal interview with the captain and chief engineer. But my calls were never returned, Cam said. Three weeks later, at the offices of the insurer in Paris, the CEO, Cam, did meet the crew. When he, his lawyer, and others representing the shipyard arrived after an invitation, they were surprised, however, that in addition to crew members, groups of lawyers were in the room, some representing the crew, others representing the insurer, and even more representing the owner. Moreover, Cam said he was told that in order to ask questions of the crew members present, he'd have to sign an agreement stipulating that everything said would be held in strictest confidence. It took French authorities over a year to release the report into the sinking of Superyacht Yogi. Before the release, they sent a draft copy of the report to the shipyard in order to give them a chance to respond. In this report, the speed indicated was 16.7 knots at 60% load. The shipyard responded that 16.7 knots was possible, but would have been at 100% load. In the final report from the French authorities, the speed was changed to 14 knots. However, the shipyard said, if you take the time the pilot was disembarked and the time they reached their final position, you can work out the speed was indeed 16.4 knots. So was the vessel traveling at full speed in that weather? This might explain why both engines overheated. The final report left many unanswered questions. No mention was made of fatigue. Fatigue could have played a part in the series of events as the crew worked all day at the shipyard to get that vessel ready to sail. They then sailed to Istanbul and proceeded to bunker. And as soon as they finished bunkering, they set sail for Cannes. They must have contravened hours of rest laws. The Beamer report made no mention of this. How is it that the crew escaped with their passports and important marine certificates, yet they couldn't manage to retrieve the logbooks from the vessel? The Beamer report also never gave a verdict on how the vessel flooded in the first place, only giving a number of hypotheses on the water leak origins, the most likely being the flooding of the beach club was due to a stern door water tightness failure. Many people in the comments of the first video concluded insurance fraud, and there seems to be many reasons to think so. However, would the crew deliberately fatally disable their vessel in rough weather, not knowing if their actions would allow them to escape with their lives? Many aircraft and marine accident investigations conclude that it is not one, but a series of mistakes that lead to catastrophe. The CEO of Protexan Turquoise, Hayati Kam, never got to read the Beamer report, as in June 2012, paramedics were called to his house by his family. They found a fatally injured Cam who had a gunshot wound to his head. The coroner reported it as suicide. And what of the crew? Did any of them lose their licenses after this disaster? No. The crew's actions were exonerated by Beamer, and within a year they were all back at sea on different vessels. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe for more to come.